record. Good morning, Astronomy 1010. Um, welcome to our second part lecture on the sun. Today we are going to plummet through the layers of the sun and we are going to learn how energy is transported through a star. This will be helpful to us when we study planets because we can compare how a star works to how a planet works. <clears throat> and of course, light and radiation from the sun affect the evolution of planets over time. So there's lots to discuss. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is to hide the trolls. Trolls have been hidden, okay. And now uh, we'll go into speaker view. Actually, no, we'll start by sharing screen and we'll take a peek at some videos of the sun once again. So <clears throat> remember that in our last lecture, we contrasted the image of the sun at visible wavelengths, here shown at 450 nanometers, to how the sun looks like at X-ray wavelengths, where you can see a lot of the magnetic activity that uh, powers some of these wild eruptions that we see at the surface of the sun. These videos are, of course, taken with the uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory which continuously images the sun at wavelengths across the electromagnetic spectrum, X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared. <clears throat> there was an older satellite called TRACE, and I think it would be kind of cool to show you guys a couple of quick small videos from the TRACE satellite um, because they'll illuminate two different types of phenomena that we see on the sun that you guys might think is cool. One are called, so we saw that Noah. Okay, uh, one of them was, <laughs> one of them are of course solar flares and the other are coronal mass ejections. And I think you guys will get a kick out of this. So let's check out a couple of quick mini movies here. I'd like to show you uh, a picture or sorry, a video of a solar flare taken with the trace satellite and, and walk you through what's going on here. It's a very quick video. <clears throat> First thing I'd like to point out is you can see the Earth to scale in this video at the bottom of the screen as a small white disk, okay? And uh, this is from 1998. I'm going to, this should be looped, but I'm going to hit play, all right? And you can see magnetic activity building up at the surface of the star. And then a solar flare takes place, a massive eruption. And then you guys will notice that gravity, the gravity of the star slurps the plasma right back down to the surface. So solar flares are usually this sort of eruption that shoots a jet of plasma out into space. Most of the plasma is sucked down to the surface, but it usually is corresponded to a, a release of X-ray particles, I'm sorry, X-ray emission and uh, charged particles that leave the sun. You might remember that in my last lecture, I told you the sun is giving off two types of emission. There is the light, the radiation, and then there is the particle emission in the form of the solar wind. So this is what a solar flare looks like. And I want you guys to contrast this um, with a coronal mass ejection. So here's a video of a coronal mass ejection. Here you can see a large magnetic field poking off the surface. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is not what I want. I apologize. Although this is part of our lecture today too. Uh, it should say CME. There we go. Sorry, guys. This is what I wanted to show you. A coronal mass ejection is more violent than a solar flare typically. And in this one, you see basically a big belch of plasma just get launched off the surface of the sun. What's powering these uh, eruptions is actually magnetic field activity. I'd like you guys to also notice that a moment after the coronal mass ejection, you can see some static strike the camera. And that static that you're seeing is probably a stream of invisible protons and electrons, which are striking the camera and causing some electrical interference. By which I mean, you're kind of seeing the solar wind, the particles being emitted from the sun striking the camera. So that's kind of cool because normally these protons and electrons cannot be seen with a telescope or with the naked eye, but you're seeing the electrical disturbance they cause. 
Coronal mass ejections can be so powerful that they can send a burst of charged particles that can actually make it to Earth and cause enough electrical interference to disable communication satellites. People on the International Space Station have to worry about them. You know, in the 1980s, one coronal mass ejection was so powerful that it knocked out half of Canada's power grid and Canada had a two day blackout over an eruption on the sun. They sometimes called them EMPs, electromagnetic pulses. That's pretty wild if you think about it, that, that a, a, a magnetic storm on the sun could be potent enough to cause electrical disturbances on earth. You will find out today that they're also responsible for the creation of the Aurora Borealis, which is kind of like nature's groovy light show, okay? Now, if I were a student and I were learning about the sun for the first time, I feel like I would have questions about magnetic fields. Most of you presumably have not had an intense physics course uh, where you study these things. Um, <clears throat> for instance, remember that I showed you this video last time of, here's some space music, but we don't need that right now. I showed you guys how a magnetic field can literally push an eruption of plasma off the surface of the sun and create a plasma waterfall that's maybe eight Earths tall. So there are these cool interactions between magnetic fields and plasma. Hey, by the way, guys, I always like to just check in on your mental health and make sure you remember things I tell you. Can someone explain what a plasma is to me, just so I know we're having a smart conversation here? What's a plasma? It's the fourth um, state of matter. Yep. So what's the fourth state of matter? And what distinguishes it from a gas, Frank? Feel free to help Frank if anyone wants to help Frank. Isn't it a charged gas? A charged gas. You remove the electrons from the atoms, Frank, OK? Think of it as a sea of protons and electrons, OK? Oh, OK. All right. So in other words, I would want to know a little bit about magnetic fields if I were you guys. And even though it's not technically part of the book, uh, the book didn't do such a presentation. I've got a quick five minute presentation or so on basic ideas and rules about magnetic fields. And I'm hoping this will help you uh, in our homeworks today as well. So let's do a little uh, module on magnetic fields together. Uh, where's that black marker? <clears throat> Title this, Rules for Magnetic Fields. Okay, the first rule is like, what is a magnetic field and how is it created? And the rule goes something like this. Um, moving charges create magnetic fields. Um, most of you are familiar with magnets, probably from these kind of refrigerator magnets that we play with some time. And if you've ever taken, you guys probably know a magnet has a North Pole and a South Pole. And if you've ever taken the two North Poles of a magnet and pushed them against each other, you can feel this invisible force field. It's a, it's a real thing. I mean, if you think about it, this is as close to magic as you get, right? This invisible barrier that's pushing these two magnets apart. What is that crap? It's a magnetic field. But to describe how this magnetic field is generated is almost a little too complicated to start out with. There's some cool, creepy stuff that's going on underneath the surface there <clears throat> with the orbits of the electrons. A simpler way to generate a magnetic field, the way that you do it in a, in a sort of physics 101 class, or maybe physics 102 actually, um, is you just send a current of electricity down a wire. A current of electricity consists of electrons which flow along the surface of a copper wire or something. And as those electrons are flowing along the surface of the wire, the moving charges create a magnetic field. Um, and so typically that means you've got, here's your wire, okay? The copper atoms have positive nuclei. I don't know if you guys have had a chemistry class, but what makes a metal a metal is that your atom might have 26 electrons, but the very last electron, 
the so-called valence electron, it's so effectively shielded from the nucleus by the other electrons that it's kind of just dangling at the edge of the atom and can be pushed around. In metals, the valence electrons conduct the current. So we can just imagine that there are some electrons in this wire. I'll just kind of draw them free of everything else. And when you send the electrons down the wire, you generate a current. Okay, that's fun. We've got a current going now. Once you generate a current, a flow of charges, a magnetic field spontaneously shows up. And a magnetic field uh, usually is in a circular shape and the magnetic field surrounds the wire. Believe it or not, you can actually get two wires if you send current uh, in the right directions to, to either pull together or to push apart, just like the magnets on your refrigerator. The people who first started experimenting with electricity quickly realized that when you send currents through a wire, somehow magnetic fields are magically generated. It took a long time for people to understand what was going on there. Um, now we've created some magnetic fields. Um, <clears throat> once we create magnetic fields, other particles that are charged, if they bump into those magnetic fields, they'll start to interact with them. But first, let me show you a couple of different pictures here that I think will be um, useful. I want you guys to imagine that I take a wire and I attach it to a battery, so I've got a little current going. And imagine for a second that I took some needle nose pliers and I bent the wire into as close to a perfect circle as possible. Now my charges would be flowing in almost a circular orbit. And when charges flow in a circle, they generate a pattern which is called a dipole magnetic field. Dipole magnetic fields are a big deal in physics and they're a big deal in our class. The dipole magnetic field means the, the shape is kind of like a bunny ear Usually the, uh, let me put this in red, usually the north pole of the magnet is associated with this part of the dipole and the south pole of the magnet is associated with that dipole. Um, we find lots of dipole magnetic fields in nature, uh, particularly if you think about it, the earth, the geomagnetic field of earth, which you align your compass with, that is a dipole magnetic field. And you wanna know what that suggests to me. It suggests that there must be some moving charges somewhere and the moving charges are probably buried in the hot sort of semi-liquid metal core of Earth. And as Earth spins, all of that plasma gets sloshed around. And that's how the magnetic field is generated. Actually, understanding the generation of Earth's magnetic field, the dynamo effect, is kind of like a wicked complicated thing. And if you doubt me, go ahead and try to read the Wikipedia page on it. You'll be scratching your head for hours. But for now, all you guys need to know is that many planets exhibit a dipole magnetic field. But the sun's magnetic field is way more complicated than a dipole. And that's because the sun is not a solid ball, but it is a gooey ball of gas. Okay, let's talk about step two. Step two goes like this. Once you've created a magnetic field, other charged particles will stick to the magnetic field. So other charges stick to, or you might even say they orbit around the magnetic field. They stick to, or they orbit around. And here with your permission, I will abbreviate uh, as M fields, magnetic fields. Let's draw a little charged particle in purple, although it probably will look black to you guys. Here comes an electron or a proton, it doesn't matter which. And this proton is going to bump into the magnetic field. And when it does so, it's going to kind of sit there and sort of orbit around the magnetic field. And that means the magnetic field has kind of captured it, like flypaper might capture a fly, OK? You know, something really interesting happens when a high speed charged particle like a proton strikes the magnetic field, <clears throat> it oftentimes has to slow down. Usually this thing will be moving super, super fast. And when it hits the magnetic field, what happens is the magnetic field sort of stops the particle. And that loss of kinetic energy usually takes the form of an X-ray. So it'll generate a very short wavelength of light 
And this X-ray emission is known as, all right, the Germans call it Bremstrahlung radiation or breaking radiation. Let's make a little note about this. Um, Bremstrahlung radiation is kind of hard to spell and I'm definitely gonna screw it up, but let me try. Brem, I think there's two S's. Lung radiation is breaking radiation. And I mean like, like when you slam on the brakes on your car. Normally Bremstrahlung radiation would be a topic of an advanced physics course, which is way the heck over your pay grade. But I think you Astronomy 101 students need to know about it for the following reason. This is how we can see these wacky magnetic fields at the surface of the sun. Um, <clears throat> as you guys know from playing with magnets, uh, how do I put this? One does not simply see a magnetic field, right? You can't see the magnetic fields between these two magnets. On the other hand, you can see the magnetic fields on the sun because this camera is looking at X-rays and every time plasma particles strike the magnetic fields, they generate an X-ray. Um, to add to this picture, I thought that I might show you guys um, one of those physics Java apps, their radiating charge app was not designed to dis to show Bremstrahlung radiation, but we can kind of use it anyways. So let's just see if I can give you another picture of how this is working. Here you can see a proton. Let's imagine it's floating in the atmosphere of the sun, and I'm going to give it a really high velocity. I'm going to jack its speed up to like 80% the speed of light, all right? Now the magnetic field, we'll imagine it's somewhere like here. Okay, and this, this charge is going to bump into the magnetic field and I'm gonna stop it, ready? So here we go and boom. And as soon as it's captured, did you guys see that little kink in the field line, that little short wavelength kink? That would be the X-ray that's being released when the proton strikes the magnetic field. Let's just do that one more time for the people in the back, ready? Boom. Captured by the magnetic field and a little short wavelength X-ray is emitted. This is Bremstrahlung radiation. And what, you know, uh, one of my favorite uh, YouTube channels, I sometimes just put this on the background, thermonuclear art. It's kind of like the best of, of the greatest hits of the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And it's really dope because this is in like 4K resolution. Um, let's not do that. Let's, because I'm streaming with you guys. Let's just go to 720p. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to show you. Um, sometimes, guys, I'll just put this on on my projector while I'm like making a sandwich or when I have friends over. It's some freaky stuff to put in the background. It's kind of cool. Um, and just look at all of this wild magnetic field activity on the sun. You would not be able to see any of those magnetic fields if it wasn't for Bremstrahlung. Even if you look at a single loop, Zillions upon zillions of particles are all simultaneously striking the magnetic field lines. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and then they're shooting X-rays towards the camera, which is how we see them. And of course, sometimes you guys will notice that you see the greatest intensity of X-rays where the magnetic field lines are strongest. Um, I got a question for you guys. What color is the surface of the sun in this picture, in this video rather? What color is the surface? It looks a little gold. Well, the, the x-rays definitely look gold, but the surface is not gold. What color is the surface here? Red. No, still not the answer I'm looking for. Like black Orange. or brown almost? No, that's what I'm talking about. If you guys look close, the actual surface down here is black. Noah, do you understand what that means? Uh, that's just the part that's, it, you're, it's only showing the magnetic field, right? It's not showing like. Right. It's the, the, I think you're, you're groping towards goodness there. When, when we look for the x-rays, Noah, we see them high up in the atmosphere where the magnetic fields are. But if you look down underneath towards the surface, 
it's black because the surface of the sun is not giving off x-rays. It might give off visible light, right? If we were looking at visible light, this would be a whole different damn thing. The x-rays aren't coming from the surface of the star. They're coming from the upper atmosphere where the magnetic fields are interacting with plasma. You're going to discover today, as we burrow through the layers of the sun, that you can look at different wavelengths to see different depths into the star. If you look at x-rays, you kind of see all the magnetic field activity in the upper atmosphere. If you look at ultraviolet, you see something else. And if you look at visible light, this surface that seems black, it would no longer appear black anymore, right? It would, it would be glowing uniformly. Let's get rid of that because that's a lot of juice. Um, remember that if we clip back to the, to the picture of the sun at visible wavelengths, the surface is not black, it's glowing because now we're looking at visible light. So you can kind of tune your telescope to see different depths into the star. Okay, one last rule of magnetic fields that we have to discuss. A moment ago, I made a goofy analogy, which was that magnetic fields are kind of like flypaper and charged particles are like flies that stick to the flypaper. I suppose though, if you had a big enough wad of flies, you could get the flypaper to stick to the flies instead of the other way around. That's a weird idea, but in this case, it happens in the sun because the sun has so much plasma at its surface that the plasma actually morphs and it twists and bends the magnetic fields, which is why you see those magnetic fields changing. So let's write it down in the following way. Sorry, I'm looking for my marker here, All right? Three. Magnetic fields stick to, or shall we say, get twisted by bulk charges, which, as you know, is just another way of saying plasma. I wish someone had told me these three rules for magnetic fields when I was first learning astronomy. They would have helped me understand things a little bit better. Um, I need to draw a picture after this. So let me just take a moment for everyone to catch up to my writing here. Okay, may I erase everyone? Cool. Okay, next lesson. Earth has a solid crusty outer surface of rock. You know that because you stand on it. And the earth spins as a solid object. We call such an object a rigid body rotor. Examples of rigid body rotors are the spinning earth or even uh, a spinning record play, a record on a record player is a rigid body rotor. All the parts rotate at the same rate around some central axis. I'm here to tell you that the sun is not solid. It is a goopy ball of gas. Like imagine a rotating ball of tapioca pudding. And because it's not solid, the sun does not all rotate at the same rate. The sun exhibits differential rotation. There's your buzzword. The sun exhibits something that we call differential rotation. So in other words, if we study the rotation of the sun by tracking sunspots, we discover that the equator of the sun has a 25 day period. And we discover that up near the poles, it takes longer or 35 days for plasma to rotate. And there's a whole bunch of gradient 
you know, a little bit up is 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. The sun is all rotating at different rates. Why that's interesting is because this is what makes the magnetic activity of the sun so nutty. Because at first, let's do this at green. The sun would probably attempt to draw, to, to generate some kind of a dipole magnetic field like Earth. So at first, there's a bunch of plasma in the belly of the sun that's rotating. And you start by generating a magnetic field that's in a dipole shape. But as the equator begins to rotate faster than the poles, the magnetic fields start to become wound up and bound up until they begin to poke out of the surface in all these different directions. So over time, several rotations will twist magnetic fields. They twist up the magnetic fields. And as you twist up the magnetic fields, it's kind of like taking a rubber band and twisting it and twisting it. You actually build up magnetic tension, which can then erupt and create those solar flares. So the magnetic tension um, can sometimes break and that creates what we call solar flares. And the other thing that we witnessed are called coronal mass ejections. All of these things are related to the magnetic cycle of the sun. And we know that the sun exhibits changes in its magnetic cycle because we've been studying it for, well, hundreds of years. And we've witnessed that the sun goes through an 11 year solar magnetic cycle. Let's go ahead and write that down. There is an 11 year solar magnetic cycle. And it's, it's related to the amount of solar flares you have. It's also related to the number of sunspots you have. Right now, we are currently in a solar magnetic minimum. So today, if I were to point the telescope at the sun, I can't do that, of course, because it's raining here. But if I were, and we looked at the sun through my telescope, you would see that the sun has no sunspots on its surface today. However, when I taught this class five years ago, I took students out to look at the sun, and the sun was covered in sunspots. So because I've been teaching for about almost 10 years now, I've actually witnessed the sun go through the solar magnetic cycle just over the course of teaching this class. That's kind of a nice, one of the few things about being here for so long that's nice. <clears throat> okay. Um, you guys got this? Okay. Now what I wanna do is I want us to march through the sun layer by layer and I want us to do some analysis. Um, so let me start off by showing you uh, a kind of picture of what we want to do. We're going to make a model that's kind of similar to that of, uh, of a planet. Um, and we're going to study these different layers of the sun. If there's time, I'll get back to the solar winds later. later. But there's about six layers to the sun that, that are worth talking about. The corona, the chromosphere, the photosphere, the convection zone, the radiation zone, and finally the core. I think I'm gonna start by writing them down on the board and then I wanna zoom in and go one by one, layer by layer, talking about the physics of each layer. Okay, so let's title this the six layers of the sun. We'd like to make a sort of loose analogy with a planet because planets are something that you guys understand. Um, and the outer two most layers, which are called the corona and the chromosphere, taken together, we can sort of loosely think of them as being kind of like the atmosphere of the sun.
The analogy isn't perfect, but it's good enough. What distinguishes these two layers are their thickness and their temperature. You know, <clears throat> keep in mind as we go through these layers that the sun doesn't necessarily think of itself having layers. It's a ball of gas and plasma that gets hotter towards the core. But the reason we've identified different layers is because energy transports through the star by different mechanisms. And there's kind of like different physics involved in each layer. The temperature is a good marker of what kind of physics you can expect. So at the corona and at the chromosphere, the corona has a temperature of 1 million Kelvin, which is pretty damn hot considering this is touching the vacuum of space. And the chromosphere has a temperature of maybe 10,000 Kelvin. They both have the same concept behind them. Both layers are low density, yet high temperature plasmas, they're in the complete plasma state, low density, high temperature plasmas um, <clears throat> that are being heated by magnetic fields or magnetic field storms. So when you guys watched those magnetic fields uh, twisting around through the, through the sun, they're kind of acting like egg beaters that are stirring up the gas and causing the gas to get heated up by magnetic field activity. Now, because the corona is so stupid hot, the corona actually gives off quite a bit of visible light. And you can actually see corona, you can see the corona of the sun during a total solar eclipse. Let's take a look at it. During a total solar eclipse, the disk of the moon blocks out the photosphere of the sun. And suddenly the layer of plasma, let's see which is the best picture here. It's like a nice high resolution one. That's kind of cool. Oh, come on. Remember when uh, the internet was cool? All right, here we go. I just, oh, okay. So here you can see the disk of the moon blocking the sun. And apparently those who have been lucky enough to see a total solar eclipse, one of the things that makes it so beautiful is the daytime suddenly goes dark, but you can see a little bit of eerie glowing light in the sky from this corona. The corona, is so stupid hot at 1 million Kelvin that that very thin low density plasma is still giving off appreciable amounts of visible light so that you can see it with your naked eyeball. Very cool. However, do not be fooled by this picture because although it does generate, although it does generate visible light, the visible light is not the primary wavelengths that the corona emits. Let's see if we can determine the primary wavelength emitted by using Wien's law, okay? So let's ask the question that goes like this. What type of light does each layer emit? So that's the question I want to ask with you guys. And it's a little bit of a cheat, but we can use Wien's law to answer this question. You'll remember that Wien's law tells you the maximum wavelength of emission of a hot, dense, glowing thing is 3 million nanometer kelvins divided by the temperature, right? That's what we're going to use. So let's start off first by doing the corona. Lambda max will be 3 million nanometer kelvins 
divided by one million Kelvin. I don't think you guys even need a bloody uh, calculator for that, do you? You should be able to do that one right in your head. Okay, so tell me what it is or cheese out and use the calculator. Um, so it would be... Um, so don't you, do you add like the, the two numbers and you divide the lead digits, you subtract the powers. All right. Just put it in your freaking calculator. All right. I thought she was cool, but I guess I was mistaken. Uh, any day now, guys. Would it be three, three. over one? Um, yeah. M? Yeah, and three over one is just three, right? Yeah, because you just um, cross everything out. Like the That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying five minutes ago. Kelvin's cancel, 10 to the six cancel. Three divided by one is three nanometers. Okay, smarty pants. I don't know who you are there, you troll, but. Kelly. <laughs> okay, Kelly, cool. Kelly, do you know what regime of the electromagnetic spectrum three nanometer light is found in? Because that's the kind of follow-up question I like to ask on exams, as you know. In what regime of the electromagnetic spectrum is three nanometer light? Do you need help? Do you need a little cheat sheet? Yeah, yeah I need help, can. yeah. Okay, yeah, gamma. Oh, X-ray? Uh, yes. Yes, it's x-ray. Let's look at the slide together. I think it's 63. You guys will notice that three nanometers is right about here. And that means that the corona, although it does give off some visible light, is primarily emitting x-ray light. Oh, I get it. That's like the Bremsstrahlung radiation, right? Okay, so that's in the x-ray regime. So let's make a note that the peak wavelength for the corona is x-rays. That was the moral of that story. Okay, I'm going to erase this and I'm going to redo it for the chromosphere now. How are you doing, Andy? Andy, you got this? Yeah, I got it. Okay. For the chromosphere, we have 3 million nanometer kelvins divided by 10,000 kelvin. I don't know if you can handle that one, Kelly, but it's the same idea. PS, 10,000 is 1 times 10 to the 4, if that helps you. Or plug it into your calculator, whichever is faster. Come on, guys, a little more fortissimo, a little less allegrando. 300. Units? Uh, nanometers. In what regime of the electromagnetic spectrum does 300 nanometer wavelength light exist? Um, ultraviolet. Very good. 300 nanometers is UV. And what that means to me, students, is that the only way to see the chromosphere is to tune the wavelength of your telescope to ultraviolet wavelengths. Let's go ahead and do that. I've got a nice slide showing, uh, oh, not this slideshow. Let's get out of here. <clears throat> Here's a picture of the sun at ultraviolet wavelengths, showing you that intermediate layer, the chromosphere. 
Now, some things that I'd like to point out about this picture. You'll notice that the chromosphere is not really like a uniform layer, but it's kind of like the, a dog that has the mange. It's kind of patchy in areas. And they call these patch, patchy areas coronal holes. Even though it's in the chromosphere, they're called coronal holes. So you can see that these outer layers of the sun's atmosphere are kind of wispy and patchy. And they're nothing like the layer that we're about to study. When you go to the layer that is the photosphere, suddenly you have to look at visible wavelengths. And now the sun appears as a sharp, crispy, it's not a solid ball, but it almost appears like a candy coating, like an M&M, because the layer of the photosphere is so thin. The photosphere is one of the most important layers of the sun, because when you look at a sunset uh, while you're drinking a pina colada on Venice Beach or something, you're seeing the photosphere of the sun. That's what you see when you look at it with your eyes on the sky. So I'm going to say a whole bunch of good words now about uh, the photosphere. Wait a minute. Here we go. Okay. I need to erase, friends. Okay, if we continue our analogy about uh, the layers of the sun being kind of like a model of Earth, then layer four, the photosphere, the closest analogy would be the surface of Earth. Except the photosphere is by no means a solid physical surface. It is a surface in light. So the photosphere could be defined in this way. It is that layer from which the visible light is emitted. So we define the photosphere as what are the layers that produce visible light? They are literally, the photosphere is the coolest layer of the sun with a surface temperature of 5,800 Kelvin. No layer is cooler. Um, another interesting thing is to consider the peak wavelength. If you guys plug that into Wien's law, Go ahead and do 3 million divided by 5,800 and tell me what number comes out. It's interesting and it's part of our homework today. Go ahead and do 3 million over 5, 5,800 on your calculator. What, what number do you get? I think it would be good for you guys to do it because I already know what the answer is. 517. So roughly 520 nanometers. What regime is that? Visible. What color is it? Do you need a cheat sheet? I thought you guys might know the color. Color? Green. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Wait a minute. Does, am I, does that mean the sun is green? I don't get it. Guys, is the sun green? What the hell am I saying exactly? I'm not sure I even know what I'm saying. I'm confused. I just had you calculate that the sun is green, right? Yeah. No. Wrong. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> you change your change your shake there. <laughs> Why does the sun not appear green if it emits more green light than any other color? Because we can't see the sun. Wait a minute, we can't. We can't. I mean, see like, 
I don't know. It was just a guesstimation. I mean, you've clearly seen the sun before, Matt, right? I don't want to make too many assumptions. Right, but I mean, like, for the color that it really is. But we can detect green light, right? Does it emit, like, too much light for you to make the distinction, maybe? Um, Unless it's too bright? No. The sun is a black body. It emits, it emits light at all different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? Like, I actually have a, a picture, a, a plot of the spectrum of the sun. In other words, how much light does it give off at different wavelengths? Function F553. This shows an idealized black body, the green curve, at 5,800 Kelvin. And you'll notice, just as you guys uh, predicted, the peak wavelength is right about 520 nanometers. So the visible light spans from 400 to 700 wave, uh, wavelengths. This is the visible light. So yeah, the sun gives off a lot of green light, but look, it's also giving off purple light and it's giving off green light. A little bit more green light, but it's still also giving off red light too, right? And do you know what happens when you mix them all together, make the world taste good? You mix the green and the red and the blues and the purples and the oranges, and guess what color comes out? Can you guess? White. That's right. White is the color of the sun because it's all of them mixed together. In fact, I want to show you guys something. Let's let a, look at a picture of this, <clears throat> the sun as seen from the International Space Station. So we don't have to worry about, um, oh, sun of ISS, sorry. Sun as seen from the ISS. And this is just a wonderful picture. Um, taken by some astronauts ab aboard the International Space Station. Look at that sun right there. Have you ever seen such a pure white in all your life? Could you imagine how cool it would be to look at the sun from above the atmosphere and just see the most brilliant, most perfect white that ever existed? Um, God, there was this kind of cool science fiction horror movie that I saw called Sunshine. It's a Danny Boyle movie. And it's, the physics of it is kind of stupid. They have to go to the sun to restart nuclear reactions, which is totally preposterous. But in any case, what I liked about the movie is uh, as the characters are journeying towards the sun, they all become addicted to staring at the sun. So they go into the observation room and they just start staring at the disk of the sun and get blinded by the, the, the brilliant light coming off of it. And I thought, that's kind of cool. I would like to like sit in the observation lounge and just stare at the sun. That'd be kind of fun. Um, anyways, the point is from outer space, the sun is white because you're mixing all the colors together. The peak wavelength merely tells us that it emits more green, a little more green than the other colors. Okay, let's talk about other aspects of the photosphere. The photosphere is a really thin layer if you compare it to the radius of the sun. So it's only 50 kilometers thin. And I want you guys to consider just what that means about the sun's photosphere. Let's imagine that we're looking at the sun. And I'm drawing the photosphere here as a super thin layer. You guys will remember that in our first lecture, we learned that the radius of the sun was about 700,000 kilometers which is no joke, that's a, that's a huge distance, right? But here, this layer, the photosphere, is only 50 kilometers in thinness. Can you guys tell me what percentage of the sun's radius the photosphere comprises? In other words, could you please take the number 50 and divide it by the number 700,000 for me? Is it about 7%? No. Why don't we start with it? So part of this was Jake was just learning about percentages. So Jake, could you first give me the raw decimal before we talk percentage? What number do you get when you divide the two? Oh, I'll do it again. But I got seven. 
7.14. There's no way that 50 divided by 700,000 is seven. Jake, Jake, Jake. Isn't it 7.1 times 10 to the negative five? Thank God. Yes, you know, wait, Jake, you can't forget the times 10 to the minus five. That's sort of important, right? Yeah. But okay. I was like, wait, I'm not typing in any differently. Like, this is the number. Right. Yeah, you said that. seven. There's a, Jake, as punishment, I want you to do something for me. Can you help me write seven times ten to the minus five out as a decimal? That's that's zero point what? Zero point zero 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 seven. You missed a zero. Okay. The ten to the minus five means the seven occupies the fifth place, meaning you need four zeros in between the decimal point and the seven. Do you understand? Yeah. So it's 0 0.000007. Is that the same as the number seven, Jake? Not quite, not quite. Not quite. Okay, now that's the decimal. How do we convert that to a percent? Does anyone know how to convert a dec like a number to a percent? What do you do? You divide it by 100? Uh, well, no, well, in this case, you multiply it by 100 because it's, it's a fraction, right? Yes. Like 7 divided by 100 is 0.07. That's 7%, right? Yes. But here we already have it. It's a decimal. So you move the decimal over twice. So what's the percentage? Seven to the minus seven? No, 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 no. No, seven. To, I mean, sorry, uh, seven to the minus three. Which is the same thing as zero, zero point zero zero seven. Right. Okay. So this is how we do this. By the way, uh, do, do you know how to say that, Matt? If you ha if you were forced to say that in English, how would we say that out loud? I don't know. Well, remember that each of these decimals has a name associated with it. This is the tenths place. Mm -hmm. This is the hundredths place. This is the thousandths place. So I would say that, Matt, as seven thousandths of 1%. Oh. In other words, what that means, Matt, is take 1%, divide it up into a thousand little bits, and take seven of those bits. Seven thousandths of 1%. So part of this exercise was just learning how to talk to each other in tiny numbers and percentages. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can appreciate just what a tiny ass percentage seven thousandths of 1% is, but maybe we could try by analogy. Um, let's consider the yellow onion, for example. Cue up picture of a yellow onion. What would you guys say is the, is the diameter? Wait, can I get a picture of a yellow onion? How big is a yellow onion? What's the diameter uh, of a yellow onion? Does anyone have an onion? I might have an onion. Okay. Well, it's a freaking red onion, but it'll have to do, right? I got an onion right here because I eat my vegetables. You know what I'm saying? Okay, anyways, um, let's measure together. Let's measure the diameter of this onion and let's make a model compared to the sun. So this onion is what? Maybe about six centimeters in diameter. That means my onion here. Okay, I need to erase up here to make this analogy. So. Let's talk about the thinness of the photosphere together. Consider an onion that has a radius of three centimeters. I want to know by analogy, how would the thinness of the photosphere compare to like 
you know that like waxy this paper skin that we see on an onion right here how thick do you suppose this this onion skin is it's definitely thinner than a millimeter i don't know if i have a, a ruler handy here oops a game that scientists constantly have to play students is a game that goes like this how big is that thing how thin is that thing could i estimate a measurement using my intuition and my mind let's see how sucky you guys are at this game because i'm sure you're going to be sucky at it everyone is that's why you play the game so uh maybe i can get my logitech thing out let's grab logitech i want to just focus my camera here i don't know th this i've tried this before over zoom this is a lot funner to do in person than uh over zoom but we gonna try because we got to try plus we're also you know wasting a little bit of time nothing like wasting a little bit of time for the sake of science mm. okay now i can auto focus or manually focus to about 33. okay so now i can get a little bit closer to the camera um you guys can clearly see where's the optimal focus can you i need some white paper behind me okay one of these little guys is a millimeter right i don't know if you guys can see this but but the skin of an onion is clearly thinner I mean, look how thin this thing is it's thinner than one millimeter. What would you estimate is the thickness of onion skin? Immeasurable. Huh? Immeasurable. You can't measure it. False. Can I tell you a strategy? If you just need to be creative, Jake. Do you want to know how I did it? Yeah. I took pieces of onion skin and I kept ripping them off the onion and I counted each strip. One strip, two strips, three strips, four strips. And I smushed together 10 strips and I held up 10 strips against a millimeter and it pretty much covered the millimeter. And by that method, I deduced that the skin of an onion was approximately a 10th of a millimeter because it took me 10 little strips to build up to a millimeter. See what I said? Uh -huh. So Jake, if you think, if you are clever in your, the measurement is an art. And if you can get clever at your art of measurement, then you can come up with a method, okay? So since I did this for you, we now know that approximately the skin of an onion the thickness is about 0.1 millimeters. Can you guys convert that to centimeters so we can do an honest comparison? Oh, please tell me you can convert from centimeters to millimeters. Otherwise, I'm just going to go to the kitchen and kill myself because nothing I do matters anymore. Point zero one. Yes, it's a tenth, right? So, point zero one centimeters. Okay. Let's ask ourselves what percentage of the radius of an onion is onion skin. That would be. 0 0.01 centimeters. Okay, Jake, as punishment for your sins, you're up. Go ahead and divide those and tell me what the death I already paid those sins. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. You'll be paying them off a couple of times here. <laughs> Not this class. I want to know that I want to know that there's growth <laughs> happening. Jake, you're my if I can just if you can grow with me today, then I have done my job as an educator. Okay. Um so you're you Brendan's have... onion. Tell me what you see in the calculator. So I see three point, a lot of repeating threes to the negative three. So three times 10 to the minus three. Now help me just write that out uh, like this, zero point. So what do I do? Two zeros and then three. Exactly. All right, now keep going with me. 
what is that as a percentage? So do we times that by 100? Exactly. Okay. Which is the same as moving the decimal twice. Yeah. 0. 0.3. And how would I say that in plain English? Point three tenths of a percent. Exactly. You do have spiritual growth, and I'm very happy. Okay. Three tenths. <laughs> Never <of> paid. Okay. <laughs> okay. Does anyone understand the point that I'm trying to make here? Because I think at some point I had a point. What's my point? The layer is thin. The layer of what? Keep going. The sun. The sun's what? The sun's photosphere. Is. Is. Wait, what do we got? Thinner than the skin of an onion. And by by how many times? Divide 0.3 by 0 0.007 and you'll have your answer. The photosphere. 42.8, so 43. Is like 50 times thinner than onion skin to scale. Make exclamation points. You see what I'm saying? If you scaled the sun to be the size of an onion, the photosphere of the sun would be 50 times thinner than the skin of an onion. In other words, um, this is why, this is why the photosphere looks so sharp and crispy on the sky. This is related to how we see the sun. The sun's visible surface, the photosphere, looks so sharp edged because that layer that's producing the visible light is like thinner than onion skin to scale. So think about it, a ball of gas in space should not look this sharply defined. I can understand earth looking that sharply defined because it's solid rock, but gases are like kind of wispy, wooshy gooey. You wouldn't expect a gas to have such a hard crispy layer because it's not so, and yet that layer is so thin that produces the visible light it almost makes the sun look like a candy coated surface. Very cool. Now we can understand why the sun's such a perfect ball on the sky. Okay, let's talk about other things about the photosphere. Um, really quickly. There are I'm not done with that sentence up there. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this one you mean? Yeah, just that sentence. Sure, just take a second to finish that up. I may have to compress some of my other layers, <clears throat> no pun intended here, so that I can get to this before the class ends. Are we cool? Uh... Yeah, I'm all set. There are two other things that we find in the photosphere that's worth talking about. So first, of course, are the sunspots. And sunspots are like Earth sized regions of cooler plasma, let's say cooler gas, and the cooler gas is being trapped in place by magnetic fields. So a sunspot is like a giant Earth-sized region. And sunspots often come in pairs because of this. Um, I'd like to show you guys a couple of slideshows. Here. So the idea is that we will find sunspots at 576. We tend to find the sunspots at the base of these magnetic field lines. There, you'll have a sunspot. And there you'll have a sunspot. And usually one is a North Pole and the other is a South Pole. Let's look at a zoom in of a sunspot here. Here you can see a sunspot in comparison to the rest of the photosphere. 
Do you see how the photosphere has a spongy mottled appearance? I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. Um, usually what happens is the magnetic fields, they trap the plasma at the surface of the star. And as the gas keeps shining away light and shining away light, it will get significantly cooler than the surrounding layers. Whereas a normal patch of sun will be at a temperature of around 5,800 Kelvin, it's not untypical for a sunspot to have a temperature of maybe 4,000 Kelvin, which is 1,500 Kelvin cooler. And because of this, the sunspots, they emit much less light and therefore they appear dark by contrast, okay? So cold. <laughs> yeah, 4,000 Kelvin, so cold. Well, it's all relative, right? Um, so the sunspots are huge, but I want you guys to notice that in addition to sunspots, we also have this kind of smaller patchwork of thing going on. And these are what are called granules. And I don't wanna say that granules are mini sunspots because they're caused by something entirely different. But the surface of the sun, if you just zoom in on a patch of, so let's just say we grab our telescope and we zoom in on a boring old patch of yellow sun and we zoom in really close we discover that the surface of the star is covered in a pattern called granulation. And these little lumps of plasma are called granules. Let's take some notes on that. The sun is covered by granules. These are much smaller and not quite as dramatic as sunspots. The granules are something like Texas sized blobs of hot and cool gas. They're not being trapped by magnetic fields. They're just caused by the natural bubbling convection underneath. Caused by the underlying convection below. Basically, they're hot and cool bubbles. And the bubbles are what shine light into space. Or I guess you can call them blobs, too. OK, I'm now going to talk about the underlying layers of the sun. And then we'll uh, pause before our homework. But let me see if I can get those last three layers in. I'll have to give you the quick and dirty version, but so be it. Matt, let me know when you're done. All right. Okay, let's do the interior of the sun. I should mention that Anything below the photosphere, we cannot directly observe. The gas is too thick for light to escape, so we have to use computer modeling and other trickery to discover what's inside the sun. And the interior of the sun can be broken down into three layers, which are different depending on how energy is transported to the star. Layer three is called the convection zone. The convection zone is a big zone. It's kind of like almost a third of the sun's radius. So unlike uh, maybe a little less than a third, but unlike the photosphere, this is a very thick layer, which is a su substantial fraction of the star. So there's not really one temperature associated with it, but I'd say in the middle of the convection zone, you might see temperatures of 100,000 Kelvin or more. In the convection zone, energy is transported through the star by, wait for it, convection. Convection is one of our three modes of energy transport. Do you guys remember the three modes of energy transport? 
it's kind of like a science thing, you know? The three methods of heat transport. Radiation. And, and conduction. conduction. Convection, conduction, radiation. Do any of you know what the difference is between convection and conduction? Yeah, but don't ask me to explain it. <laughs> Let's take a look at convection. Um, so here's a model showing the convection zone, the radiation zone in the core. I don't know if this is perfectly done to scale. Um, this is a mechanism of convection that's going to be important as the days get colder here. You might call this a radiator, but in fact, it's not radiating, it's convecting. The way this thing works is slabs of air sit inside of these pockets here, and they touch the metal and are heated up by first conduction. And then the pocket of air begins to grow and expand. And as it expands, it becomes buoyant, like a hot air balloon. And a big bubble of gas will rise, and it will displace a cooler bubble of gas, which will sink. The important idea about convection is that you're pushing around giant blobs or bubbles of gas. Let's contrast this with conduction. Conduction is different because Oh, by the way, examples of convection, a lava lamp. If you can think about how a lava lamp works, classic convection. You heat up the paraffin wax, the bubble expands, it rises, cools down, and sinks again. So convection is like lava lamp. Conduction is atom to atom jiggling. If you take a pork chop and you put it on a frying pan and you're sizzling it, you're connecting the, the pork chop molecules with the metal molecules and the jiggling pan is going, the jiggling molecules of the pan will jiggle your pork chop and they will sear it. When you sear something, then you are using conduction. So in other words, one way to talk about convection is to say hot blobs rise, cool blobs The reason why the convection zone uses convection is because the convection zone is a mix of neutral gas plus plasma. And the neutral gas absorbs photons and it causes the hot air balloon effect. Not so much in the underlying layer called the radiation zone. In the radiation zone, temperatures start to really go up. Typical temperatures for the radiation zone could be up to a million Kelvin. And that means your gas is now a fully ionized plasma. Unlike neutral gas, ionized plasma is no good at absorbing photons. And therefore the photons kind of scatter and ricochet their way through the radiation zone. In other words, in this zone, energy transport is not happening by convection, but is instead happening by radiation. And in this case, short wavelength, high energy photons actually scatter off of the plasma particles, kind of like, kind of like a giant pinball machine. Um, I'll just write down here, short wavelength. They're probably X-ray or gamma ray. Uh, if I plugged that into Wien's law, what would I get? Where's my calculator? I can't find my calculator. Oh, by the way, maybe even 1 million Kelvin. Can we change that? Um, let's make it 10 million Kelvin. It's even hotter than the um, short wavelength, probably X-rays, because that's probably 0.3 nanometers radiation. Short wavelength X-rays scatter off the plasma. That's how light is transported through the star. Um, since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to quickly flop down the, the final layer for you. 
and have you take some notes on that. At the heart of the star is, of course, the nuclear core of the star. And the nuclear core of the star has a key temperature. The temperature is 15 million Kelvin. In the core of the star, <laughs> sorry. In the core of the star, energy is not being transported so much as energy is being generated here. And the energy generation is in the form of nuclear fusion. I'm going to erase the convection zone so I can add a bit more to that. So in the core, energy is generated by hydrogen to helium fusion. I won't have time to get into the reaction because I'm kind of running out of time for the day, but I'll tell you the name of the reaction. The reaction is what is known as the proton proton chain. We study it extensively in my astronomy 1020 course. So there's a pitch for 1020 if you need another science course. Um, but I will tell you the overall net reaction because I think it's interesting. The net reaction of the hydrogen fusion is that four hydrogen atoms smash together they create one helium nucleus and two gamma ray photons. And I'd like to point out that during the fusion reaction, you're actually converting some of the sun's hydrogen into helium. So you're changing the chemical composition of the sun. But it is the two gamma rays that are responsible for all of the sunlight that you see from the star. Those two gamma rays will leak out of the core. They will leak into the radiation zone where they will pinball their way through the radiation zone. Then they will heat up the convection zone, which will generate bubbles. The bubbles will rise to the photosphere. The photosphere will shine the light into space. And eight minutes later, the sunbeam hits your face while you're drinking your pina colada and life is good. But all of those sunbeams that hit your face, they all started out as gamma rays in the hydrogen fusion at the core of the sun. The journey they took to get to your face was an incredible one. They have to work their way through all those layers of the star, but that's how the sun produces its sunlight. Okay, um, in fairness, I'm probably out of time for the day, um, but we did, we did some good stuff. Uh, before we do our homework on the sun, does everyone like the idea of taking a little uh, 10, 15 minute break to chill? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, so that's a hearty yes from Bella. Um, let's, let's pause the recording and at uh, 1.15 we'll, we'll kick up chap the number seven homework, okay? Cool beans. Okay, everyone. Um, back in action here, if you guys are ready to do this. Uh, I believe we've got homework seven. Joel, if you'd be kind enough to help me find them numbers. Definitely need to, uh, I gotta go get some more black markers today. Can't forget that.
Hmm. Jake, you look tired. <laughs> I think we've all got a case of the Wednesdays right now, huh? Did you stay up super late watching the the Game Six of the World Series? No, I stayed up super late watching a movie. <laughs> but I was looking at the homework. I always like focus too much when I read, so I look like <laughs> I'm zoning out. So, how do you feel about the what was it? The Dodgers one? How do you feel about yeah. that? Joe? Uh, well, we don't have to hear about the Dodgers getting screwed over. It's been <laughs> 32 years since they last won. When are they going to finally win one? <laughs> now, gotta... now, now we can go back to. Well, the Yankees haven't won a World Series since 2009, and the Red Sox have won three of them, or two or three of them. I can't. I don't know. I, so, so in other words, you're uh, begrudgingly giving it to them, right? <clears throat> no, no. I, I, I fully expected them to to do what they did. I said Dodgers in six. <clears throat> Should have put some money on that, son. And oddly enough, the player that got them over the hump was Mookie Betts. <laughs> but in my eyes, he proved why he should be considered the best player in the league instead of Mike Trout. But that's the best player in the league is always up for debate. So. All right. Well, anyways, let's get back to outer space here for a second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so Homework seven is chapter seven. And that's... Uh, chapter 14, you mean? Well, you've got ch two questions from chapter seven and then three from chapter 14. Oh, bloody hell. Did I do a hybrid thing? Uh, okay. Because chapter so... seven is... There's a density classification and then a planetary parallax. Um, hmm. No, I don't, I don't think we want to do it that way. Uh, okay. I, I may have not updated this. This might actually be my fault, everyone. Uh, can we see what the 1010 schedule says here? Uh, I need to fix that's, that. And that's what's posted on Blackboard. Yeah. So here's what's happening. So that blackboard was a carryover from the summer. The summer we don't have as, as much time. We're gonna do these problems instead. And uh, Joel, thanks for pointing that out. I need to fix that. This is an announcement to anyone watching later. The actual homework assignment is chapter 14, number 47. This will dovetail with what we learned about today. 50. 55, 56 and 59. Now, um, I'm very concerned that I am going to forget to update this later. So let's go to Blackboard and fix that ASAP because I'm the kind of dummy who will completely forget to do this. So I need to, up, there's, I need to make a few tweaks to this setup here. So all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna edit this. And, uh, oops, excuse me. I don't know how to delete that. So here, we'll just fix it here. Uh, 4750. You just have to have 59. And I'll make sure, control copy. Okay, okay. So it'll just weirdly have the chapter seven questions posted. Next week, we might do just chapter seven or a mixture. I'll need to update that again. But for now, at least it's reflecting the right uh, problems. All right, that'll help. So uh, Joel, if you can open up and Joel, if you're down to read us the 47, that would be great. Oh, great. A really strong force. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. Jesus, I've made two errors here. I don't want to do a really strong force because we did not cover fusion today. Those, oh, man, I'm messing this up. Uh, I'm sorry. 
it's a combination of them changing the questions and also the me changing my approach. I want our first one to be number 50. So I'm going to remove 47 and I want to replace it with 50. Let's see, 55 is good. 56 is good. And I want to do the color of the sun. I want to do 59. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Actually, do you guys, you want to do two fun, easy ones? We'll do 59 and 60. That'll actually make our homework even easier and better. We all like that, right? Anyone object to easier, faster, better? Trust me, you're going to be happy with this. And we'll do number 60. This will be a little, a little easier than our usual homework. Actually, no, you know what? I got a better idea. 62. Sorry, guys. I need to teach you stuff. This will be good for our atmospheres chapter. 50, 55, 56, 59, 62. Sorry, I don't really like being a fly by the seat of my pants guy here, but that's just the way the cookie is crumbling. I used to have you guys do the strong force problem, but it's really long and wordy and complicated. You would have hated doing that problem. And also, it's about fusion, which I really didn't have time to get into. So it, what I'm doing makes sense. You just have to trust me a little bit. Okay, so let's remove 47 and let's add 62. Uh, one of the reasons it's hard for me to remember which is which problem is because they change the numbers of the problems each year. So it it's, gets hard to remember what's going on. All right. All right. All right, Joel. Is that your final answer? I know, I know, I know. Uh, yes, that's my final answer. You better lock that in. I better lock that in, yeah. <laughs> Fifty, fifty-five, fifty-six, fifty-nine, and sixty-two. All right, Joel, take us out on chapter fourteen, number fifty, please. Uh, solar energy output uh, it says observations over the past century show that the sun's visible light output varies by less than one percent, but its X-ray output can vary by a factor of 10 or more. Explain why changes in X-ray output can be so much larger than those of the, than the output of visible light. Class, what does the sun produce more of? X-rays or visible light? I would say visible, visible light. light. I'm sorry? Visible light. Very good. The sun produces more visible light than x-rays. So what is the question asking then? How did you know the sun produces more visible light than x-rays? You want to answer that, Andrew? Um, Hmm. Joel, do you know? I have a theory. What's your theory? <clears throat> well, I got the rays mixed up, but I like so. I think so. Like, so, gamma rays are produced in the center at the core, which is small. But they don't. No, 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 no. Yeah, but the gamma rays don't <clears throat> leak out at the at the surface. Right. But Hold on a the, second. I don't know. Yeah. Why don't we look at the spectrum of the sun together? How about that? Wait, did I close the chapter four? Oh, bloody hell. Yeah, uh, I, I messed up my race and that throws my theory off. All right, no, I, I need us to understand this before <laughs> we move forward here. Let's look at the spectrum of the sun together.
Where is it? 53. Where is the visible light in this diagram? So this is a plot of intensity or a quantity of light on the y-axis and wavelength on the x-axis. So it's basically saying, how much light do I get at all of these different wavelengths? Where is the sun producing the greatest amount of light? Invisible light. Right. Remember that visible goes from 400 to 700 nanometers. And the graph is tallest in that zone. Jake, where are the x-rays in this diagram? X-rays are, I want to say about maybe like 200. Even smaller. The x-rays are like down here. X-rays start at 10 nanometers. Oh, okay, yeah. So do you agree, Jake, that the sun is producing like way more visible light than it is X-ray light? Yes. Because the, the, those different wavelengths are produced at, at different layers of the star. The sun produces the greatest amount of light in the visible spectrum, OK? I wanted to just prove that. Now we have to ask ourselves, what does this question want from us? What is it saying? Because it sounded to me at first like it was saying the sun makes 10 times more x-rays than visible light or something stupid like that. I just want to make sure you guys have the reading comprehension to interpret the question. What does the question want us to? Does anyone know the answer to the question? So because the x-rays are so like, I'm going to probably say this wrong, but the quantity of the x-rays is so small so that the level of variance is greater um, for the sum, but the visible spectrum is, is bigger and has a greater output. So the, the variance is smaller. That's not too bad. <laughs> that's actually, that's actually pretty decent, Joel. It's about the variability. There's less x-rays, but they're more variable. The visible light is greater, but it's steady. Let's draw that as a graph together. I think that's going to be helpful. I want this as part of your answer. Let's make a different kind of graph, a graph of brightness over time. And they suggested the period could be about 100 years, OK? So on the y-axis, we'll plot the brightness in watts per meter squared. And on the x-axis, we'll plot time in years from the year 1900 to the year, say, 2000. So that's a period of 100 years or so. I'm going to use black for visible light. And you can see that the visible light is constant, and it's only wiggling around at the 1% level. So very small variations uh, from top to bottom in the visible light. And I'm going to use purple for the x-rays. Now, there are less x-rays, but they're much more variable. So for instance, you'll get periods with low amounts of x-rays and then high amounts of x-rays. And we discover that they're varying with an 11 year cycle. Meaning the greatest maximum amount of x-rays is often a factor of 10 times greater than the minimum. One of the first things we should do is make sure we're comparing apples to apples. I don't like that this is a factor of 10 times and we're comparing it to 1%. Do you guys know how to convert a, uh, a number into a percentage? Jake? Times it by 100. Okay, so what would, the, what would a factor of 10 be as a percentage then? A factor of 10 would be um, what percent? Hmm. I'm really bad at math. 
Well, but the goal is to get good at math, right, Jake? It's okay to be bad at math as long as we want to learn. So Andrew said times by 100, so try that. Times 10 or times? Well, it's, it's a factor of 10, right? Yes. Jake, do you know? Uh, Jake, if I said 0.5, what does that mean as a percentage? Five tenths? No, uh, 0.5 is five tenths. But as a percentage, half. which is what percent? 50. 50%. So what would 0.8 be as a percentage? 80. OK. Oh, what, okay. Would, what would 1 be as a percentage? 10. Oh, wait. The number 1 expressed as a percentage is wait what what did you say earlier about how to do it jake it's probably 100 is it 100 it's 100 percent. so what do you think a factor of 10 is 10 hundred i don't know <laughs> as a real number jake i mean 10 hundred one followed by three zeros. 10 hundred is kind of the right answer, but 10 hundred is a really lame ass way of saying a thousand. Don't you agree? Well, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> I'm serious. That is what I meant. I, I know it's what you meant, but why didn't you say it? A thousand is like a more organic way to say it. But well, I'm bad at math, so that's why. <laughs> a factor I've of been in C level. I've been just in. Just move the really decimal place fun. twice. If it's the number 10, the number 10 as a percentage is a thousand percent. Sure. <laughs> okay, so we're learning. <laughs> so look, maximum to minimum is a thousand times greater than maximum to minimum for visible light, right? Okay, so now the answer is why. Why are x-rays fluctuating so wildly while the visible light is steady? Can you guys think of any answers? Let's talk about layers. What layer is producing visible light? What layer is producing x-rays? Maybe that's a good place to start. Maybe I should have left it at question 60 at this rate. Hey, you guys don't know what layers produce the visible light? You don't know what layers? Photosphere is producing the visible light and- And, um, and the x-rays? Corona. So who said that? Matt. Matt, can you think of a reason why the x-rays being produced in the corona might be fluctuating like this, whereas the photosphere light is not fluctuating? Maybe they're being corrupted by the plasma eruptions. Yeah. Like disturbed by it. The plasma eruptions. And what causes the plasma eruptions? Oh. The differential rotation or the differential rotations of the sun? Not exactly. So magnetic fields? Yeah. Um, I want to read something to you guys. Uh, yeah, it's in your book under the heading of solar storms. I know most of you don't have the book, so allow me to read here. The magnetic fields winding through the sunspots and prominences sometimes undergo dramatic and sudden changes, producing short-lived but intense storms on the sun. The most dramatic of these storms are solar flares, which emit bursts of ultraviolet light and X-rays and charged particles into space. So in other words, why are these fluctuations so dramatic in X-rays? The simple answer would be what? Because of the magnetic field. Yeah, the magnetic fields are like storms on Earth. They kind of come and go. And when you've got a lot of magnetic activity, you get bursts of X-rays, and then you go to a quiet or quiescent period, and then it kind of chills out for a while. So you're basically seeing the connection between 
the magnetic field cycle of the sun and the bursts of x-rays. Let's try to put that into paragraph form. I'm going to erase this and we're going to write a big ass paragraph. Changes in X-ray emission are so much more variable than changes in visible light. because the X-rays are produced in different layers and by different processes. And now we're going to explain what I mean by that. We'll start with the x-rays. X-rays are produced in the sun's corona. by interactions between twisting magnetic field lines And charged part, uh, and uh, should I say charged particle? Let's say charged particles. That's the bremsstrahlung that I was talking about today. As the magnetic storms fluctuate. with the 11 year, the key term is solar magnetic cycle. As the magnetic storms fluctuate with 11 year solar magnetic cycle, we can underline that as a key concept. So does X-ray emission vary. So this kind of explains that the X-rays are being produced in the corona by interactions with magnetic storms. Visible light on the other hand is produced at the photosphere. Hey, uh, here's a, th a thinking question for you, class. What produces visible light at the photosphere? I don't think I remembered to put that as a note. What's producing the visible light at the photosphere? What makes the photosphere glow? What if that was a test question? Could you answer it? Is it the like hot Texas sized granules? Huh, yeah, kind of. Yes. Yes. Like and hot and cool air. You're 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 right, Jake, but the key addition that you need to the concept is 
those those little bubbles are glowing because of their temperature. They're basically glowing like a light bulb or like a hot ball of flame or something. They're they're glowing because of their temperature. So we would say that visible light, on the other hand, is produced at the photosphere by thermal black body radiation. And we could say because the temperature remains constant at 5,800 Kelvin, because the temperature remains constant at 5,800 Kelvin, so does the output of visible light. It's getting harder and harder to write. A visible light with only a 1% variation due to fill in the blank. Can you guys think of what might be causing that microscopic 1% variation in visible light at the photosphere? What might be causing a 1% variation in the output of visible light? The distance traveled? No, the distance traveled is a vacuum. There's no, no loss there, no variation there. Sunspots. Yes, these sunspots actually come and go and they can change the, the luminosity of the sun by a really tiny amount. So nicely done, Jake. Sunspots. It's really blurry. Really? Shit. <coughs> Should I move it closer? No, it, it fixed itself. Okay. It was just you transferring and popping stuff on the screen. Let's let you guys uh, take a second to finish that up there. So to get further in depth or further explain it, is yep. it, does it have to do with the electrons jumping through the stages or steps or of, uh, I can't think of the right term, but. Up. I think you're thinking about the, the orbits of the electrons and atoms. Yeah, doing like the five to two step or the four. No, 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 totally no, not. A, because okay. that's, that's bound emission. Bound yes. emission means the electrons are bound to the atoms. This type of radiation is known as free emission, where an electron is traveling freely through space on its own, but it hits a magnetic field and causes it to give off an X-ray. You know, okay. Joel, in a weird way, if you could pluck an electron out of an atom, if you could wiggle that electron up and down, you would generate light. Cool. Right? In fact, <laughs> in a weird way, uh, just taking like a, taking a, well, a, a pith ball, if you took a rubber balloon and you rubbed some charge on it and you could spin it around in a circle, you would actually generate a very, very low power radio wave. Interesting. So just taking a charged particle and making it wiggle, that causes it to radiate. So when they hit all those magnetic field lines, they're not bound by any atom, but they're just giving off bursts of x-rays because they're moving so fast and then you sort of slam the brakes on them. Okay. Um, 
I don't know if you guys are ready for me to erase yet, or does anyone need more time on this? All right, I'm erasing and removing. And hold on. So after, <laughs> um, after the magnetic storms, what is that word? Um, As the magnetic, yeah. Fluctuate. Okay. It means vary. Or no, vary. yeah, I couldn't. Even, I couldn't. Even, um. Read it out. <laughs> Sorry. No, that was my bad handwriting. Any other words, Bella? I hope I spelled that right. It looks funny now. No, I'm no that was the one I couldn't read. Thank you. You got it. So, Bella, are you okay if I race? Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. That, by the way, one of the reasons that I did all those question jiggling, there would have been another epic question like that. I think we, I only had the strength for one. Ironically, Jake, it's the math questions that are easier. The word ones are the hard ones. You people, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta keep it simple, Jake. Okay, 55. Jake, read it out for us, you math lover. Oh, awesome. Chemical burning in the sun. When an object burns in a fire, the amount of energy released through this chemical burning is typically about 10 to the eight joules per kilogram of mass burned. Use this fact to estimate how long the sun would last if its energy source were a huge fire releasing chemical energy rather than its actual source, fusion energy. This question attempts to answer how long could the sun shine if it was a big ball of fire? Remember that the sun shines with a luminosity given by four times 10 to the 26 watts. So we're going to imagine that the sun is basically a, a big ball of flame. And all of that light is being produced by, by some kind of fire, okay? Remember also that the sun has a reservoir of mass of two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Our goal is to mix all these numbers together and end up, oh, I do have another marker. Happy, happy joy. Oh, this is lovely. And somehow for us to end up with a how long? Man, I don't see how we're gonna do this. There's no time in here anywhere. Where's, where are we gonna get a time from? <clears throat> Watts is joules per second. Oh, let's start there, okay? Four times 10 to the 26 watts, Joel correctly points out, is four times 10 to the 26 joules released from the sun every second. And presumably, those joules are being produced by fire. According to Jake, fire will release 10 to the power of eight joules for each kilogram. Can anyone think of a good way that we can mix these letters and numbers together and end up with a unit of time? Let's try to attack this problem from the point of view of dimensional analysis. What if I started multiplying and dividing these numbers? How could I end up with a unit of time in seconds? The game goes like this. I've got three numbers and three sets of units to work with. And in the end, I want to end up with some unit of time, which will likely be in seconds, because I have seconds in my givens. Can you guys come up with a way to jiggle these units around so that everything cancels itself out except for seconds? How would I do that? This is kind of like a little puzzle. Hold on. Um, what 
This is what you have to work with. This, this, and this. And I want you guys to mix and match them like like shuffling cards. Oh, I know this. Okay, what do so, I do? Okay. Let me see. So um with the so with the KG um so Oh shoot. All right, so one of them is going to be Hold on. KG and then JKG and then I mean joules on top and kilograms on bottom? Yeah, that problem. Yep. That's good because that cancels out the kilograms. And then it would be and then it'd be um joules seconds. Uh, where do I put that? So joules would be at the bottom to cancel out joules, and then seconds will be on top. Very good. Andrew, you kick an ass today. That's exactly what I wanted you to do. Nicely done, sir. Okay, Andrew, to finish up your good work, can you also tell me now how to put the numbers in correctly? So All what right, so, so that'd be the four... Times ten to. But it's it. Keep the numbers with their units. Oh, kilograms. Oh no. Oh, it would be the two times ten to the thirtieth. Okay. How about what goes in the bottom? Nothing. How about on the next one? All right. Two times kg times um. Oh, the second one would be, would it be the four times 10 to the 26? Nope, that has units of joules per second. Oh, you would have to, okay, convert them. Hold on. No. 10 to the eighth. Yes, no, a 10 to the eighth. Where does 10 to the eighth go? No, I want you to be very explicit. Top. What goes on the bottom? One or nothing. Good. 10 to the 8 joules is produced by one kilogram. All right. What about this last dude? One on top. Then four times 10 to the 26. Nice. Okay, guys. Wait. Punch him up. Hey, how do you punch that into your calculator? I know a few of you are going to screw this up. How do I put that into my calculator? Tell me how. He, he oh, type ten. Use the x squared button. No. <clears throat> it's that new button he showed us last no, week. No, no. The way you put ten to the eight, ten to the eight means one times ten to the eight. You do one exp eight. That's how you put in ten to the eighth, because the exp has the ten in it, right? One times, 10 to the eight is the same as one EXP eight. Do not forget that. Okay, what do you get? Okay, Cam, say it out loud, say it proud. I got five times 10 to the 11th power. Units? Uh, S. Seconds. Seconds, yeah. So, uh, Cam, that's mm -hmm. a lot of seconds. I think we should try to convert that to years. Cam, I want your mm -hmm. help. Cam, why don't you work yep. with me using dimensional analysis to convert 5 times 10 to the 11 seconds into years? How do I start? Okay, so... Page. So you write down a number to convert with its units. So, 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 
what would you so like you to make it make a division bar? Wait, that's step two. We need step one first. Oh, so you want so we want to convert seconds to years, right? So, Cam, remember that the first step is to write down the number to convert with units. Right. So I, I want you to tell me what number and what units to write down to start. So to do five times 10 to the 11 seconds on the top of the division bar. Well, that kind of just sits by itself. Now we can do the division bar. Okay. So here's step two. All right, what's step three? So sec so five so five times 10 to the power in seconds go to the bottom? No, 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 you're, you're, step three is only about units. If you okay. read step three, it says put the units in first. So there should be no numbers involved. Okay, so minutes? We're so minutes on top and seconds at the bottom? I like that. Now we've canceled out seconds. And now we should keep doing step three until we get to years. So there's- Okay, so minutes should be at the bottom and hours should be on top. That will cancel out our minutes, keep going. And then hours be at the bottom and days. Yep. And then one more. And then days be at the bottom and years would be at the top. Good. Now and then our answer would be uh, years for units. Hold on. Now you've got to put in your conversion factors, Cam. Okay. So what numbers go in each of these division bars? So there would be... So 60 seconds, right? So where does the 60 go? Uh, the bottom. Good. And that's 60 one seconds minute. and one. Okay. And then it'd be 60 minutes in an hour. Yep. 24 hours in a day. Yep. And then 365 days in a year. Exactly. Okay. So now take five EXP 11, divide by 60, divide by 60, divide by 24, Divide by 365 and tell me your answer to two significant figures. So I got 15,900. So about 16,000, what are the units? Uh, years. And what that says to me, my friends, is that the sun is not a ball of fire because if it was, it could only be 16,000 years old. That might be long enough for some popular books, but it's certainly not long enough to explain the geological layers of Earth's history. Or a, even a dinosaur bone can clearly be shown to be older than that. So the message is the sun is not a ball of fire. That's considered the proof that the sun cannot be a ball of fire. QED. All right. Um, Andrew, Noah, are you guys comfortable with me racing? Yeah, I'm all set. All right. I will erase now. Two down, three to go. Um, uh, let's see, who, who can I bug next? Noah, would you be kind enough to read us number 56, if that's cool with you? Yeah, uh, the lifetime of the sun. The sun's chemical composition was about 70% hydrogen when it formed, and about 13% of this hydrogen was available for eventual fusion in the core. The rest remains in layers of the sun where the temperature is currently too low for fusion. Um, and then do you want me to read A? Um, actually, can you just hold off for a second? Yeah. 
what I want to do is I want us to draw a picture, a pictographic representation of what's going on. So make a big circle over here on the left. And then draw the core of the sun. Now, the first point that they want to make is that the sun is not just hydrogen. It's a mixture of hydrogen and helium. And even though it's 70%, 70% is pretty close to 75%, which is pretty close to three quarters. So let's argue, first of all, that since hydrogen is being fused inside the sun, only about three quarters of the sun's mass can even be used for fusion because basically one quarter of it is already in the form of helium and you can't, the sun cannot fuse helium. The sun can only fuse hydrogen into helium. So the helium is inert or it's, it's useless as part of the reaction because it's already the end product. Now the other 70% is hydrogen. That can be used, but not all of the hydrogen can be used because in the outer layers, it's too cold for fusion to occur. The only place where fusion can occur is in the central core where those hydrogen atoms, the 13% is, is actually hot enough for fusion. So in other words, this question in part A is gonna want us to calculate what is the reservoir of hydrogen that we can use? We can't use this because it's helium. We can't use that because it's cold hydrogen. What is the fraction of the sun's mass that we could use as a reservoir for energy? So now with that in mind, Noah, could you read us part A? Yeah, uh, use these data and the sun's mass to calculate the total mass of hydrogen available for fusion over the lifetime of the sun. Okay, uh, Noah, I know I'm kind of getting you on the spot, but would you know how to do that? If I were to tell you, for instance, that the mass of the sun was two times 10 to the 30 kilograms, what would be your uh, instinct on how to proceed? Um, I want to say, you would take like, 13 percent of 70 um or no yes 70 percent of 13. kind of well first of all we could reduce this by multiplying it by the 70 percent right right and that will give us just this wedge and then we could take the 13 percent to only get the inner wedge right yeah. and how do i make those a percentage 70 and 13 percent uh 27 0.13. Exactly. So first, Noah, when we multiply the sun's mass by 70%, that gets rid of the helium. And then whatever mass is left over, this is like a compound percentage. We now multiply by 13%, and that'll whittle it down to only the stuff in the core. So when you do that, what do you get? Got a uh, 1.8 times 10 to the 29th. Units? Uh, kilograms. Nice. Okay, when you're ready, we'll take question B. One sec. Um, the sun fuses about 600 billion kilograms of hydrogen each second. Based on your results from part A, calculate how long the sun's initial supply of hydrogen can last. Give your answer in both seconds and years. Um, how many zeros are in a billion, Noah? Nine. Nine, very good. So that means your fusion rate is 600 billion kilograms per second. Now, this is the reservoir of matter that we have to work with. And this is how fast we crunch through it. We want to know how long will the sun last? Do you guys see how to do this? It's very similar to what we did in the previous problem. How would I go about doing that dimensional analysis wise?
Does anyone kind of understand? So 1.8 times 10 to the 29th kilograms. Okay. Times the division bar. Okay. And then seconds on top and over kilograms. Nice. And then put the numbers in Joel. And then one second and 600 billion kilograms. Perfectly done. I like your moves, son. Notice the kilograms cancel and seconds remain. Cam gets three times 10 to the 17. What are the units? Seconds. Now, we also need to convert this to years. Now, Cam has already done in the previous problem, he did it the long way where he converted seconds into years. Now, because I like you guys, but most importantly, because I like myself, I'm going to give you the conversion from seconds to years. It may come in handy in the future. One year is equal to 3.15 times 10 to the 7 seconds. That's a pretty helpful conversion factor to know in astronomy. So let's go ahead and Jake, help me convert that to years using your conversion factor. It's a one-step shopping operation. How do I start? I'm on mute. Okay, so you would write three times 10 to the 17 seconds. Correct. Times a division bar. Correct. And then you'd put seconds on bottom and year on top. Okay. Now put the numbers in. All right, so the bottom would be 3.15 times 10 to the seven. Yep. Top. One. Awesome. Okay. Definitely typed it in wrong. Well, type it in right then. What'd you, what was the answer you got, Jake? It was like, I mean, I just deleted it, but it was like 20 numbers long, beginning with a nine. That sounds like the right answer. And it okay. wasn't 20 numbers long, count better. Was it 952? Sorry, Cam, no good. Mm. It's supposed, Bella? To be a, supposed to be a big number, Jake. Oh. Bella's got the right answer. <laughs> Noah, you're a little shiny there. I can't quite see your. Why don't you guys just tell me what it says? Just put it in scientific notation and tell me the answer. Two sig figs. See, this is what I got, and I feel like it's incorrect. Yeah, no, put it in scientific notation, Jake. Oh, that's right. Um, I already know nine what the point, answer is. I, I want 9.5 times 10 to the 8. Count better. 9. Units? Years. How do you say that in plain English, Jake? It is 9.5. Five billion years. Very good. That's how long the sun can shine. Okay, Noah, part C, take us out. I just read the whole thing on mute. <laughs>
given that our solar system is now about 4.6 billion years old, when will we need to worry about the sun running out of hydrogen for fusion? In other words, the current age of the sun is 4.6 billion years. We estimate that the sun can last for a total of 9.5 billion years. How long does the sun have left? Sun will die when? What do I do? You just have to subtract the age yeah. from the lifetime. 9.5 billion minus 4.6 billion. And the answer is the sun will die. 4.9 billion years. We have 5 billion years left of sun shine. And after that, the sun will go dark. Well, actually, it'll turn to a red giant and burn the earth out, but that's a whole different bag of beans. Damn, I might still be alive. <laughs> you could evolve into a hyper intelligent dragonfly with a uh, positronic brain net matrix. That was too sci fi for me. The okay, question is die. will the Dodgers be winning the World Series then? Tampa Bay probably still won't win a World Series. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna need to Windex this down because my board is getting really cruddy. It's getting real, real cruddy. <laughs> the real question, Brendan. Yeah, shoot. Is how many more Star Wars movies will be made? Actually, that's a good point. That as long as people keep buying the tickets, they'll keep making them, you know? James Cameron will outlive us all. <laughs> all right. The next two are really fast and easy, and then the last one is a little tricksy again. Um, Cam, are you down to read? Oh, wait, no, sorry, there's only two left. The next one's wicked fast and, and easy. Uh, Cam, do you want to read us number uh, 59? 59. 59. 15, hold on. I have to log back in. So 59 asks, use Wien's law and the sun's average surface temperature of about 5,800 uh, 5, K to calculate the wavelength of peak thermal emission from the sun. What color does the wavelength correspond to in the visible light spectrum? Why do you think the sun appears white or yellow to our eyes? Okay. We have to find the peak wavelength emitted by the sun, which we kind of already did today. And then we want to explain that the color, why, and there's kind of two questions. Why is the sun yellow? And keep in mind that it's yellow from the ground. And then why is the sun white? Remember from today's lecture that it's white from space. Uh, they suggest that we use Wien's law. We also used Wien's law in today's lecture. It tells us that the peak wavelength 
lambda max is given to us by 3 million nanometer kelvins divided by the temperature. So let's get to be about that business. Lambda max is 3 million nanometer kelvins divided by 5,800 Kelvin. This marker is going to need a refresh. About 20 nanometers. And what color did we decide that corresponds to? Green. That's right, green. Okay, so let's address the questions one at a time. Why is the sun yellow from the ground? Any thoughts? Does any of it have to do with it passing through the atmosphere sure does um noah let me let me uh share a slide from our chapter on planetary atmospheres which will come up in a week or two um what color is the atmosphere noah If I had to say something, I guess blue, but I, I don't know. Does it have a color? Yeah. Well, no, but I, from the ground, it looks blue. All right. The, the atmosphere is clear, so you have a point there as well. Now, if the peak wavelength is green and the atmosphere is blue, hmm. isn't there something about green and blue and yellow? I can't remember how this goes. Anyways, let's, let's so, take a look. So, so the atmosphere... So the green appearance of the sun. Well, remember, the sun doesn't actually appear green. It appears white. So if you look at this picture, okay. Joel, there's all kinds of photons coming from the sun through our atmosphere. There's red photons, blue photons, and not shown here, there are also green photons, right? But the blue photons are much shorter in wavelength. So what happens is the blue photons, ping, they scatter left and right out of the field of view. But then they scatter off air molecules and they scatter back down towards us. So if we look in any direction in the sky, the whole sky is a field of scattered blue photons, which have all been taken out of the path of the sun. The result is that the new spectrum of the sun is blue deprived, and it's a mixture of kind of reddish and greenish photons which end up looking kind of yellow, right? If you think about it, the sun's not always yellow. At the end of the day, the sunlight has to scatter through a longer atmosphere at sunset. And you are removing even more blue photons through scattering. And if you think about it, the sun actually looks red at sunset because you've scattered so many blue and some green photons out that only the red photons are getting to you. So the answer to the question of why the sun looks yellow is because blue wavelengths are scattered by Earth's atmosphere. By What about the white color of the sun from space? Now let's address why the sun looks white. It's a different answer. Underline scattered, because that's the key concept. They are scattered by the atmosphere. I was going to say, since the sun like is producing 
wavelengths at all different levels. Yep. We already talked about it. Like the color comes out white because it's all the colors mixed together. Exactly. And that the, the, the only phrase I wanted you to add to that is because the sun is a black body and it produces all those wavelengths. Okay. So it's white because the sun is a black body and thus produces very good, Jake, all wavelengths of light, which mix into white light. That was pretty good. That tells me that you guys did retain some of the knowledge from our class today. And with that, we are four down and one to go. Um, the last question that I originally started to do was gonna be a stupid easy one like this, but it was just so stupid that you wouldn't learn anything. The last question I think is very interesting. We're gonna, it's also a chance for us to use the ideal gas law. It taught me something about the atmosphere of the sun. We'll see how it works for you guys. Um, first of all, let me just make sure everyone's had time to write this down. Does anyone need another minute here? I don't see Andrew anymore. Are, Andrew, are you gone? Okay. We lost Andrew, I guess. I'm going to erase. Matt, I guess you're the last man standing. Are you down to uh, read the final problem? Yes, I can read it. Okay, hold on. Let me get queued up here. Okay. Uh, this is chapter 14, number 62. What's the title? Uh, pressure of the photosphere. All right. All right. Let me see, Matt, uh, before you get going, let me see if any of my markers are a little better than this one. No. 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 Well, I'll try this one. Okay, bud. All right, so the gas pressure of the photosphere changes substantially from, the, from its upper levels to its lower levels. Near the top of the photosphere, the temperature is about 4,500 Kelvin, and there are about 1.6 to the 16th gas particles per cubic centimeter. Okay, um, Matt, can I just pause for a second? We're now going to imagine that the entire photosphere, you guys remember the thickness is about 50 kilometers. And let me just explain what's about to happen here. We're going to break the photosphere into three layers, a top layer, a middle photosphere layer, and a bottom layer. So this is just that thin 50 kilometer strip and it's all shining light into space, okay? This is the photosphere. Now for each layer, they're gonna give us a temperature and they're gonna give us a number density. You'll remember that number density are particles per cubic centimeter. So Matt, for the top layer, what was the temperature? It was 4,500 Kelvin and there were 1.6 times 10 to the 16th gas particles per cubic centimeter. Um, because space is at a premium, I wanna remind you that I can write particles per cubic centimeter as centimeters to the minus three. That is ugly as all hell, but it's a condensed way to write particles per cubic centimeter. Okay, continue. Matt, do you need a moment to kind of catch up to us here? Uh, I can I can write it down after. Okay. All right. So uh, in the middle, the temperature is about fifty eight hundred Kelvin, and there are about one times ten to the seventeenth gas particles per cubic centimeter. Okay. And at the bottom of the photosphere, the temperature is about seven thousand Kelvin and there are about 1.5 times 10 to the 17th gas 
particles per cubic centimeter. All right. Use the ideal gas law to compare the pressures of each of these layers. Explain the reasons for the trend that you find. How do these gas pressures compare to Earth's atmospheric pressure at sea level? Okay. So today we learned that the photosphere is a layer of hot gas. And I want you guys to compare it to the atmosphere of the air in this room. Remember that the ideal gas law, which you learned about in your previous lecture, is a relationship between the pressure of gas, the number density, and the temperature. P equals NKT. Um, if we're gonna compare it to sea level, air pressure, I will remind you, is 100 kilopascals or 100,000 pascals. Um, how should we begin this problem? What do you think we should do? Joel, what should I do? I think it's time to crack open a new black marker. <clears throat> like a fresh one. Well, we have the N and T. Okay. What about our units, Joel? How are our units feeling? I'd like to remind you guys that the pressure is measured in units of pascals. I'd also like to remind you that the Boltzmann constant is 1.4 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin. Pascals and joules are MKS units. Are particles per cubic centimeter MKS units? It needs to be in meters. It would have to be in per cubic meters. So yeah. Joel, this is going to be a challenge of your dimensional analysis skills. I want you guys to pay close attention to what we're about to do. We're about to do a level two dimensional analysis thing. Okay. So I've got a special treat for you. Joel, right now, your number densities are in particles per cubic centimeter, but that's not going to work. This thing needs particles per cubic meter. I know you know dimensional analysis already, but there's a new trick here. Help me convert the first number density into MKS units. So let's convert N to particles per cubic meter which is the same as meters to the minus three. Okay, how should I begin, Joel? Well, one times 10 to the 16th particles per cubic centimeter. Which I'm gonna write as one over centimeters cubed to help you. Which is the division bar. Okay. And then Meters on top. Or, and then, centimeters. Well, yeah. I have the right train of thought. I'm just trying to figure out how to say it. Because, it, it, well, we have to do, No, I'm backwards because it has to be one over meters cubed. Forget it. You, you should not be thinking about numbers at all. Joel, you should not. No, be no, no. I'm, 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 I'm not thinking numbers. I'm, I'm thinking how to get the part of, how to get the particles per It's just meter about, cubed. it's just about units. It's just about units. Just so if we do centimeters cubed on top, because that would cancel out. That's right. And on the bottom, that, that was that was what I was trying to figure out. And then meters, meters cubed on bottom. OK, now what's the conversion between cubic centimeters and cubic meters? That's the real question. 
Yeah, so one cubic meter. Well, oh, one, cent, one, one, one centimeter equals, or no, one meter equals 100 centimeters. Good. But, so, but if you're doing area length times width, does 100 square centimeters equal? So let's think about this. If I'm doing area, what is one square meter equal to in terms of square centimeters? 10,000 centimeters squared. Very good, because you have to square the number. One square meter equals 100 squared centimeters. Oh, sorry. 100 squared centimeters squared, right? So by analogy, yeah. what should my conversion be here? One over 100 cubed. Hold on, be careful. It's meters to cubic meters to cubic centimeters. No, I said that backwards. Yeah. It's 100 cubed meters to one cubic meter, right? Yeah. The important analogy, let's just talk about what we learned there because this is a new thing. When units are squared or cubed, you have to not only square the units or cube the units, you've got to cube the conversion factor too. That's an easy way to always be able to convert. Linear area volume, they're not the same thing. One meter is 100 centimeters. One square meter is 100 square centimeters. One cubic meter is 100 cubed cubic centimeters. Okay, what is 100 cubed? That's 10 squared times That's six zeros. Six zeros. Okay, so let's do it in our head. 16 plus six gives us what? 22. Is it 22 uh, particles per cubic meter? Okay. May I point out to the class that from now on, all we have to do to convert from cubic centimeters to cubic meters is add six zeros. That ought to speed shit up for us, right? Now that we've worked through that intellectual argument. In other words, write this down. One meter cubed is 10 to the sixth linear cube. That's what we proved to ourselves. Okay, I need to erase because I need more blackboard space again. One second. I'm good. All right, let me erase and then we're gonna crank this out real fast. You guys have all those numbers for me, right? I hope so. Let's make this nice and organized. Let's do the top. For the top layer, we have pressure equals one times 10 to the 22 cubic meters times 1.4 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. What was it, 4,500 Kelvin, Matt? Yes, that's it. Punch them up. Zero point fourteen. Oh no, I'm I'm sorry, I forgot one thing. Sorry.
Please, anyone, put me out of my misery here. Is it 630? Can I get someone else to verify that? I don't remember what it is. I got 632. I mean, 630 as well. What are the units? Pascal. Did we do that right? Yeah, because one point one times 10 to the 22nd times 1.4 times 10 to the minus 23. So that leaves you with minus one. And that's. Okay. No, yeah. you're right. What are the units? Pascals. How many kilopascals is that? Divide by three zeros. Wait, that's a point six three. My Boltzmann constant is correct, right? Yes. All right. So that's point six three kilopascals, or as a percentage of Earth's atmosphere. 0.63 over 100 is 0.063. 0.6%. So it's like roughly one, the top of the photosphere is close to 1% of the density of air in this room. Isn't that crazy? That layer that's producing the visible light at the top is barely even 1% of the density or the pressure of gas in this room. It's a very thin gas compared to Earth's atmosphere. Now let's do the, let's do the middle layer. The pressure, now the original number density, if I'm correct, Matt, was one times 10 to the 17. So if we add six zeros, this time it should be one times 10 to the 23 cubic meters times 1.4 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin times 5,800 Kelvin. Class, what does that produce? Cam, what'd you get? Hold on. Anybody? I don't care. Whoever's got it. I got 8,120. 8, 8, Units? E. P. A. Yeah, Pascals. Or 8.1 kilopascals. What percentage of our atmospheric gas is that? Eight point one percent. Right. Or about eight percent of atmosphere. Finally, for the bottom layer, what was the original number density for the bottom layer? 1.5 times 10 to the 17th. So that'll be 1.5 times 10 to the 23, right? Yep. You have to add six zeros times 1.4 times 10 to the minus 23. What did they give us for the temperature? I can't, was it? 7,000. Wow. Punch that up nice and quick and then we're done. 15,000. 15,000? That's fast. That's... 
which is the same as 15 kilopascals, 15 parts out of 100 is 15% of the atmosphere. You know why I love that problem? Because you might have thought that the photosphere was actually a dense layer of gas, but the entire photosphere ranges from a tenth of the pressure of this air that we breathe to 15% of the pressure. The photosphere is thinner gas than the air in this room, and yet it produces all that visible light from the sun. I guess that helps explain why this would be a black body. Hell, if the gas that's 15% of the pressure of this room is a black body, so will the flame from this big lighter, right? Plus there's a chance for me to play with fire on the camera here. <laughs> Okay, congratulations. You have completed homework seven. You are masters of the sun. Uh, thanks for putting up with my uh, crap. And uh, I can't wait to do this again with you next Monday. Please get Pardon? your home. Pardon? Just lower it a little bit more so I can just get the last bit numbers. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for racking my brain, Brendan. <laughs> well, that was cool that we got to learn some extra skills at the end of the day here. I bet um, Jake's glad you picked on me. <laughs> <laughs> I was laughing at like why he likes that problem. I'm like, is it because it's full of math? Well, because it teaches me something, Jake, something I couldn't otherwise know. Like I now know about the surface of the sun. It's like I've touched the sun with my mind. And I don't know, it's part of the science bug that's in me is you want to know how things work. And you're just curious about nature, you know? Um, the, what I want you to see is you can do some, some dorky math and then you can understand something cool about the sun that wouldn't be easy or obvious to understand. I also think it's good for you guys to get experience with the ideal gas law, because then when I talk about atmospheres, you'll have more to think about, okay? All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Presumably everyone's got their stuff here, right? Okay. And